Okay, all right. Um, no, thank you to um, Caitlin and the organizers for um, asking me to give this talk. Um, I'm not sure how broad it will be because it's only 30 minutes. So I tried to pack in probably too much. Um, but I'm going to be talking mainly about uh, simulations of accretion and evolution onto binaries. Um, and the four main things that I want to look at are actually going back to my, my PhD thesis days, talking about accretion onto binaries. Um, then a little bit about chaotic star formation, um, just pointing out that the universe is a lot more complicated than we think it is. Um, I'm probably going to get myself into trouble talking about some lessons I learned from modeling giant planet migration. Um, and then I'll talk about some detailed modeling of two particular observed circumplanetary disks and what I've learned um, from that. Um, so I think uh, accretion onto binaries in the context of star formation uh, it goes back, I think, to Pavel Artemovitz's work in 1993 um, and my work at the start of my PhD, um, which was very similar. And that was taking a binary system and just injecting ballistic particles, so no gas even, ballistic particles onto that binary and looking at the evolution of the mass ratio and the, the um, orbital separation. Um, and what you find is um, that the ballistic particles, obviously, when they get close enough to the star, then you have to say they're accreted because there's no dissipation. Um, but if you do that, then you find that low angular momentum, uh, the binary separation contracts, and the primary catches more material than the secondary. Um, when you have high angular momentum in your ballistic particles, uh, you get the reverse, so the binary orbit expands, and uh, the secondary tends to capture most of the particles. Essentially, they fall into some characteristic radius, and then the secondary it's moving around, mops them all up. Um, just to note that in order to get the mass ratio increasing, uh, you don't require the secondary to accrete more than the primary. All you require is that this ratio is greater than Q, right? So it's less of a, a stringent criterion. Um, so then later on in my PhD, uh, we did the same thing, but with gas. So basically we turned on uh, viscous and pressure forces, and that gives you SPH, uh, and looked at gas accretion. And I still find this somewhat amazing, but in terms of the binary separation and mass ratio evolution, if you assume that in the ballistic case, the particles are accreted when they hit the Roche lobes, um, then you actually get almost identical uh, behavior from the ballistic particles as from the, from the SPH simulations. Um, but the difference, of course, is that the presence of dissipation allows you to form disks, and that's quite nice. Um, so you get simulations or pictures a bit like this, um, so what we've got here is a, a circular binary. These are all circular binaries. Injecting gas at some large radius, it was eight times the binary separation, letting it fall onto the binary and see where it goes and its effects. Um, just to emphasize, this is not circumbinary disk accretion. This is circumbinary accretion. Okay, So it's three-dimensional. You're injecting particles from high latitudes as well. The only limitation is that um, obviously, if you're injecting high angular momentum material, then you can't eject it near the poles because otherwise it's not bound to the binary. So when you've got a high angular momentum, it's more a torus type structure that's accreting. Um, and so for uh, uh, gas, which has got no angular momentum initially, it's just radially infalling. You find most of the gas is captured by the primary. There's a small circum primary disk that's formed. No disk around the secondary. And there's no disk that forms around the secondary until uh, the specific angular momentum of the infalling material exceeds the specific angular momentum of the secondary around the center of mass of the system. And then you've got, if you like, excess angular momentum to form a disk. You then got two circumstellar disks. And obviously, if you go to higher uh, specific angular momentum, then you start forming uh, a circumbinary disk with a cavity as well. Um, and so obviously, this depends on the mass ratio as well. Uh, so two different mass ratios, different specific angular momentum. If you have too much specific angular momentum, then obviously everything just falls into a certain binary disk. You get no accretion at all on the dynamical time scale. Um, obviously, this would eventually viscously evolve. Um, here, for example, Q equals 2.2. Um, your secondary has a lot of specific angular momentum around the center of mass, so you need quite high specific angular momentum of your infalling gas before you form a disk. Um, so that's uh, the sort of thing that you get. And then you can look at the relative accretion rates, which are here as a function of Q. 
uh, the uh, rate of change of the mass ratio itself, um, separation uh, change. And it's probably a bit hard to see, but um, in, in particular on the separation, there are actually three lines here, or there's four lines, I guess. Ignore the fourth one. You don't know which the fourth line is. The solid line is from the gas simulations, all right? And the long dashed lines are from these ballistic calculations where you assume that anything that hit the Roche lobe is accreted. And you can see that the, the, the evolution here, these bottom lines, is almost identical. So you don't actually need the gas dissipation in this at all to get the right answer. Um, it's a little bit different for looking at the mass ratio at very high specific angular momentum. But actually, the ballistic calculations do a surprisingly good job. OK, so then you've got uh, the evolution of a binary in terms of mass ratio and separation uh, as a function of uh, mass ratio and the specific angular momentum of the infalling system, uh, infalling gas. And so you can then do a long-term evolution, uh, very simple calculations, where you assume you start with some binary given separation and mass ratio, uh, and then you accrete an envelope of gas onto that binary, and you get your final stellar binary. And you can look at how the envelope accretion uh, affects the properties. Okay, So basically, you're accreting one shell at a time, working your way out through the envelope. Um, each particular uh, actually ring of this shell has the same specific angular momentum. You compute the, you've already computed the effect of that, so you just change the binary. And this is the evolution of a binary with a given initial mass ratio, accreting from a uniform density solid body rotating cloud. And you can see that the long-term evolution here is that you always drive the mass ratio to unity. It's because it doesn't really matter what you do. As you go to shells that are further out, they're going to have more specific angular momentum relative to the binary. So you always end up in this high specific angular momentum accretion uh, region of parameter space, if you like. You can look at other separation change. You can look at whether you form a certain binary disk or not, and so on. Um, just to point out that um, you can obviously come up with different assumptions about your initial envelope here. So you could choose a singular isothermal sphere, for example, which is quite popular in the 80s and 90s. Um, you can actually rule out the singular isothermal sphere as the initial conditions from star formation by these sorts of calculations, because you find that everything goes to mass ratios of unities, and everything has a certain binary disk really fast. Okay. Um, so uh, this is also from the, the 2000 paper. Basically, I wanted to check these uh, uh, semi-analytic um, binary evolution calculations by running uh, long-term uh, SPH simulations and seeing that you get similar results. Uh, so the top simulation here, um, the, these dot dashed lines are the, the evolution predicted by the simple evolutionary uh, code model. This is the mass ratio uh, evolution actually from the simple code and also from the actual SPH simulation. See, it does a very good job. Separation initially decreases then starts increasing here. Um, for the case here that forms a circumbinary disk, uh, you underestimate, sorry, not taking into account the gravitational torques uh, once you're building up this more and more massive circumbinary disk means that the simple model um, overestimates the separation because the circumbinary disk starts removing angular momentum um, from this inner binary. Um, but overall, the simple model is not too bad. Um, so that was circular binaries. Um, what about more complicated things? Because things are more complicated in real life. And these are uh, some unpublished movies um, from the mid-90s, um, which were still lying around on my solid-state drive now. Obviously, they weren't there originally. Um, this is a Q equals 0.8, E equals 0.8, accreting uh, high specific angular momentum material. And this is quite um, amazing in the sense that the, the disks around the binary here are being formed uh, on the dynamical time scale by the infall. And then, of course, every time the binary does an orbit, it smashes the disk to bits, right? Um, and this just carries on forever. Um, well, it doesn't actually carry on forever. Because if you look at the evolution of this, of course, the eccentricity of the binary is decreasing very slowly with time, as you expect from dissipation. Um, but just to point out, these can be a lot more complicated than just the circum binary case. Um, and this one, this is really weird. Okay, so here the gas is rotating around the vertical axis, but the binary is orbiting around this axis. So the disks that you form um, are uh, edge on and reflect the angular momentum of the larger material, uh, but the binary itself is orbiting in the plane of the screen here. Okay, so very weird. Okay, 
Um, the, trough, the problem with these is unlike the circular case, it's very hard to get quasi steady state solutions, which is why I never really published this stuff. Um, okay, so that takes us on to more complicated things in reality. And the other thing I'm probably well known for is doing these large simulations of star cluster formation. So it's a calculation that was published in 2012. 500 solar masses of gas um, has structure which is generated by decay and turbulence, which you put in initially. The gas collapses and every white dot that you form here is a star or a brown dwarf. Some of them get ejected. Uh, some of them form little groups and clusters. And there's all sorts of evolution going on there. Okay, and this was the first large scale simulation to produce a realistic population of stars. Okay, by realistic, I mean, the initial mass function was similar to what we observe. Uh, multiplicity, so whether or not you're a binary or not, as a function of primary mass. Uh, more massive stars tend to be multiple systems. Low mass stars tend not to be multiple systems. That was pretty well reproduced. Um, even things like mass ratios of binaries as a function of mass of the binary, not too bad. Um, but what you don't see on this large scale, this is now zooming in, um, is that we had the resolution there to model disks around these uh, stars as well. Okay, so we used uh, accretion radii of 0.5 AU, which means that you can resolve at least for a little while disks um, down to sort of AU size, sizes or a few AU. Um, and so you can look at the disk properties as well. Um, at least the sort of class zero objects. So objects with sort of ages of 50,000 to 100,000 years or so. Uh, by the way, that's a certain binary disk there. Uh, these are two single stars. Okay, and so it took me a long time to actually analyze this because it gets rather confusing. So first of all, I'll show you the movie. Um, so we've got a 400 by 400 AU box here uh, around the first star that forms. And then more boxes will appear as more stars are about to form. And this shows you the sorts of interactions that are going on in this calculation. Okay, so you can't look at all of these because there's 183 of them. But this one here, there's a wide binary that forms initially. You can just see it at the edge here. It suffers orbital decay, mostly through accretion. You get a star disk encounter, forms a binary with a certain binary disk. Then you actually get an interaction with another object. Um, this one's kind of interesting to watch because this is an edge on disk, which actually um, reorientates through 120 degrees as it's accreting. And this one up here, there's a disk here with this orientation and then one at 80 degrees which is it's like a broken disk, but it's not actually a broken disk because the outer disk falls, forms from accreting gas with a different angular momentum vector than the original gas that formed the system. Okay, and then it gets blown apart by some other thing that flies by. So my point is, um, this is really, really complicated. Um, but amazingly, if you look at the statistical properties of the disks from these simulations in terms of masses and sizes, they actually compare very well to the masses and sizes of disks um, that are observed, particularly for low mass, uh, sorry, for young objects such as class zeros. Um, um, so uh, that was published in 2018, that's a disk analysis. Just to point out that I did some new cluster simulations that were published in 2019 with different metallicities. Um, and the disks of those were analyzed in this paper just published a few months ago by my PhD student. Dan Alsander, who's somewhere in the audience, I assume. There he is. Um, so yeah, if, if you're interested in how disks depend on metallicity, you might want to look at that paper. Um, and then I'm not going to spend any time on this at all, but just to show you that um, observers are now seeing these sorts of things. And I assume John Tobin will talk about uh, this a lot more this afternoon, so um, I won't steal any of his thunder. Um, so this is all stellar binaries. What about um, black holes? So just a few comments. I think the black hole binary disk situation, at least in galactic centers, is likely to be just as messy as this, all right? In the sense that there's no reason to expect that black hole binaries in the galactic center will have circular orbits. Um, and there's no real reason that the accretion flows that they're subject to um, should have the same angular momentum vector as the orbit of the black hole binary itself either. Um, and the other thing is at least when these black hole binaries are wide, um, not all accretion might come from a, a clean circumbinary disk, right? As I said, the, the simulations I've shown you here, there's infall and circumbinary disk accretion going on simultaneously. So it could be a lot more complicated 
Um, and there might be some differences like thinner disks, more viscous disks, and so on. Okay, so this is probably going to be the most controversial bit of the talk. Um, okay, so lessons that I've learned from studying giant like planet migration. Um, so simulations that don't conserve momentum, I've learned over the years, are a bad idea. All right, and this might sound obvious, but you might not see where this is going yet. Okay, don't do simulations that don't obey Newton's third law. If any of you have forgotten what Newton's third law is, in Wikipedia says. If two bodies exert forces on each other, these forces have the same magnitude but opposite directions. Okay, so we all know that, fine. Okay, so we've got the Earth and the Moon, and the Moon's in orbit around the Earth, more or less. Um, okay, so fine. So you do a simulation of this, and you've got the center of the Moon is the black dot, center of the Earth is the black dot. And this is like the, the well, here we've got, we've got a mantle and a crust and things like that. Who knows what we have on the Moon? Anyway, that's the yellow stuff. So if you calculate the torque on the moon here, well, you've got a little bit of mass here, which is pulling the center of the mass of the moon that way. And you've got a little bit of mass here, which pulls the center of the mass moon that way. And if you sum up all of these torques, then obviously there's no net torque and the moon keeps flying around the earth for a long time. This is ignoring tides, tides from another thing. Fine, okay, what about a moon with a really large mountain on it? like Olympus Mons sort of size. Okay, so we've got a big mountain here. Now you calculate the torques on this. Let's zoom in. Okay, so you want to calculate the torques acting on the center of the moon here. So you have a little bit of this mountain and it pulls on the moon. Okay, and there's no mountain over here, so there's no other thing over here balancing that. So that gives you a net torque on the moon, and the moon then accelerates and moves to larger separations. Okay, this is rubbish. Okay, because all it's telling you is you've got the center of mass of the moon in the wrong place. Okay, because you're you're thinking about the force of the gas on the planet, but not the sorry the moon, but not the force of the moon on the on the crust in this case. Okay. Okay, so I learned this lesson 20 years ago. Actually, I think I learned it earlier, but it's easier to show from 20 years ago. So simulations of giant planet migration. All right, we wanted to determine the radial migration rates of giant planets. And Steve uh, mentioned one of these papers uh, a few days ago. So we use fixed planet orbits, as lots of people do. I know back reaction on the gas on the planet, i.e., breaking Newton's third law, okay? Okay, so what did Steve find? Well, he mentions in the paper that the torque contribution from near the planet is in the opposite sense to the bulk of the disk. So the disk wants to make the planet migrate inwards, <clears throat> but if you include the torques near the pl planet, <clears throat> you actually find outward migration. And this was found by Gennaro D'Angelo uh, a few years later in his simulations that if you included the torque from near the planet, usually resulted in outward migration. <clears throat> okay, what about 3D? So Gennaro and myself, working independently, published the first 3D calculations of this about the same time. Gennaro was a little bit first, very annoying, but anyway. Um, and we found that the going to 3D reduces this Roche radius torque problem, um, but it still persists. And then we all started working together, right? Gennaro and myself and Steve. Um, we found that these difficulties persist even with high resolution. So just to illustrate this, um, it's worse for high mass planet cases, and that's because you get a second planetary disk here. And you can see that these disks have these strong spirals in them. Okay, so this is a 2D calculation for similar to Steve's 1999 work. Uh, this is what happens with 3D, so it's not as bad because you don't get these very strong spirals in the two dimensional case. But still, if you've got any asymmetry in this disk here and you calculate the torque, acting on this uh, planet, which is presumably embedded in here, then you just need very small asymmetry to get a very large torque because the densities here are high and the distances are small, okay? And so, I don't know whether you can see this, but this is the torque density as a function of radius for the Jupiter mass planet case. The solid line here is the torque that's coming from the disk outside of the hill radius. This dashed line here, which is this enormous spiky horrible thing, 
uh, is including the torque from inside uh, the hill radius. And you can see that this is massively positive and can easily overwhelm this, this other thing. But this is like the mountain on the moon. This is rubbish. The problem is that the circumbinary disk, the circum, sorry, circumbinary disk, sorry, circumplanetary disk, there's too many disks. Circumplanetary disk and the planet itself hold themselves together like the moon and the mountain, right? You're not interested in these talks from going on in here. Okay, so you can see where this is going. Um, okay, so we've got a lot of recent simulations of orbital evolution of binaries due to circumbinary disk uh, interaction. I frequently find in outward migration, but there's no consensus. You run a different code, or you run some different simulation parameters and you get different results. So what's going on? Well, they're using fixed, mostly using fixed stellar or black hole orbits, i.e. no back reaction in the binary. They're mostly 2D, which we learned makes the problem even worse because if you get these asymmetric torques from inside the Hill radius, or in this case, the Roche radius, that's bad. And they include the torques from the whole computational domain, right? So there's no, there's no um, idea here of excluding torques from inside the, the Roche radius. Um, there's at least one exception. Maybe I've missed one, but I couldn't find any others. So Heath and Nixon use a live binary. So in other words here, equal and opposite forces. And they find mostly orbital decay, except possibly extremely thick disks. So H of R of about 0.2. Um, but I think you want to think about this because we had this problem 20 years ago in the planet case. Okay, last thing is uh, modeling observed circumbinary disks. So there are at least uh, two systems, probably more, but two systems that I know well where there's been detailed modeling of observed circumplanet circumbinary disks. Okay, um, and uh, one has already been mentioned. This is uh, the GWRE system. Um, thanks to Roman, I don't have to explain too much about this. Um, but this other one here, um, HD 142527. Um, observed here by Avonhouse, but modeled by Daniel Price in 2018. What you've got here is scattered light disk. You can see these spirals. There's a binary in here. That's the, the, the apparent separation of the binary. And you're thinking, well, how the heck can a binary that small make a disk this, this cold this big? It's because it's on an eccentric orbit, okay? Um, so Daniel spent a lot of time and many, many calculations trying to model this thing and trying to reproduce all the observed features that you see, all right? And one of the problems with this is the binary orbit is constrained by observations, but it's not constrained very well. So the gray orbits here are all the possible orbits that, that are still allowed by the observations, at least at 2018. Um, so Daniel couldn't run this many simulations, that's insane. Um, <clears throat> he, he picked three different orbits, the sort of blue family and the red family of orbits, so six orbits. Um, you have to also have to make assumptions about, well, how big is the hole in the inner disk that you start with? So this is a 50 AU hole, a 90 AU hole, all right? And you can see there are similarities, but also differences between um, what you get depending on the initial disk size hole. So these are the animations, or some of the animations that were published in the paper, just to show you um, what you get with slightly different orbital parameters. This is orbit R1, one of the red family. This gave the best spit fit that they found to uh, the spirals and the shadows. Oh, I didn't mention the shadow. Rats, sorry. Uh, okay, so you see here, there's, there looks like shadows uh, sort of at the top and the bottom of the disk. And that's presumably coming from uh, circum stellar material in here. Sorry, Caitlin, give me another 20 seconds. Okay, so this, this one here gives the best fit to the spirals and the shadows. Um, so the spirals you can see here, that's obvious. And then you get a certain primary disk here, which is orientated uh, basically edge on and vertically here. And that, the idea is that then produces the shadows on the outer disk here. Um, this one here, slightly different orbit, gives the best fit to the cavity size. This one just gives nothing that looks even remotely similar. Um, and this one here, the certain planet, the certain primary disk, is in the wrong orientation to explain the shadows. All right. So the point is, these simulations are very hard because uh, we don't know the system um, that well, but nevertheless, you can get similar sorts of observed features. Um, they also did some work modeling the large dust population, the small dust populations, um, 
and trying to look at these streamers using uh, simulated HCO plus. Um, and they got at least qualitative agreement. Okay, the last thing is the GWRE system. And I mentioned, need to mention too much, much about this because Roman already mentioned it. Um, <coughs> triple system embedded in a disk, um, but you see these rings. Okay, so these outer rings are oblong, right, egg shaped. And that's because they're presumably round, but viewed at some angle. Whereas this one here is, is well, it was to be very round. So basically it's probably observed face on, um, but it's eccentric because the stars are not at the center of this ring. So we've got a, a, a disc, uh, a ring here, which has got an eccentricity of about 0.2. Um, and unlike uh, Daniel's case, um, this binary is extreme, sorry, triple system is really, really well characterized due to many years of observations. So we thought this is great. <clears throat> this is a potential first example of disk pairing, which has been mentioned. And we run the simulation and we got, uh, a, well, we ran many simulations and we got something that looks like this, uh, which is quite a good fit uh, to the observations in the sense you get this uh, ring, which is torn off. Um, it's eccentric. You can see the stars are not at the center. Uh, has the same sort of orientation and position of the, of the triple system as here. And this is the movie. Which is not playing <coughs> very close to the end now. Um, so this is what the observers see. Uh, this is what happens if you look that way. This is what happens if you look that way. And this is a slice uh, through the disk. And you can see as this goes, the disk becomes more and more warped. <clears throat> okay, and eventually you start breaking this ring off. You probably see it best here first. But then you can see it here. And you can see that this ring has a completely different orientation to the disk. It then goes a little bit nuts for a while. So it actually starts to interact with the inner edge of the circumbinary disk. Things settle down again. And at the end, you've got something that looks very similar to the observations. Okay. The problem with this, okay, so that's great. It might be the right explanation for the system. But the problem is if you change things a little bit, then you get different results. Okay. So so Biotel and Smallwater have looked at this as well, and they don't think that the answer is this pairing, but they use different parameters to us, right? So, for example, larger H over R, steeper surface density profiles, and so on. And even for the parameters we used, if you use slightly different H over R values, you get completely different uh, disk breaking. And these are not very different H over R values, right? So, <coughs> oh, and just to mention my undergraduate students, I had them looking at that as well. So May, Jasmine, and Joey, they looked amongst other things at the effect of um, the surface density profile. So again, this is a flat disk, R to the minus half, R to the minus one. And again, you get differences to do with the disk breaking. So I just want to finish with, this stuff is hard. Real life is complicated. I think life is easier if you obey Newton's third law. Um, and I'll take some questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, I'm particularly grateful to you for bringing up something a little bit controversial. Now, before everyone has questions on orbital evolution, I'll remind you, there is a session starting just after the coffee break entirely devoted to orbital evolution. So does anyone to start have a question that is not about orbital evolution? Okay, go ahead, great. And please say your name so people can. Hi, I'm Savik Ford. Um, I actually had a question about your more recent um, simulations of the whole cloud collapse. So you showed in your earlier simulations that you had a very nice uh, agreement with the mass multiplicity relationship uh, in your IMF. And in your newer simulations, you're varying the metallicity. And I'm wondering if you uh, can reproduce observed metallicity multiplicity variations that are observed yeah yeah yeah. okay so so um <clears throat> you mean for example this this um uh observation that the metallic sorry that the frequency of close binary systems depends on metallicity perhaps yes yeah so that is actually in the 2019 paper and and actually <clears throat> the effect was actually apparent in simulations that i did investigate the metallicity back in 2014 but i didn't notice it um until the observers, where's Mo? Uh, yeah, Max, Max Mo and Karim. Anyway, until they pointed this out, um, 
I then went back and looked at the simulations from 2014, and the, the effect is there. Um, and this comes from um, essentially um, <clears throat> the differences in the ability of gas to fragment on small scales with different metallicities. So at low metallicity, <clears throat> you have more fragmentation on small scales, which leads to more close binary, a higher close binary frequency at low metallicities. And that is in the simulations. Yeah. And is that <clears throat> at low mass, but at high mass? <clears throat> Um, so I really only have good statistics from sort of M stars, maybe up to solar mass stars. Okay. So. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, anyone online <clears throat> with a question? We haven't heard from anyone online. Okay. Anyone in the room have a? Uh, okay. I see. I see. We're going to orbital evolution here. So let's go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go. For it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually wanted to, to make this, the same comment right you now before all these folks here fire up about the orbital evolution. So in particular, we have a massive black hole binary discussion session tomorrow. Uh, so, you know, you can keep all your energy uh, for that. Uh, a comment on, uh, on, on, the, on this specific thing. We, we actually did 3D simulation with the live binary, thinking exactly about the same, uh, the same thing. And, uh, we, we still see for some parameters uh, orbital expansion. So, and I guess there the thing is that you, you don't just have a mountain there, right? You are keeping sending mountains on your objects. So maybe the situation is a bit more complicated than that. But yeah, we, we, we still do see, uh, we, we still see um, uh, orbital in, you know, enlargement for, for some of the parameters. Yeah, okay. All right, all right, next up we have two questions online. Let's go first to Rajika and then Andrew. Hi, um, Matthew. I have a question about your cluster simulation with the, you're looking at the multiplicity of that. Um, do you, because you said you resolve the disks, but do you, are you able to resolve disk fragmentation? And could you learn about the contributions of disk fragmentation and core fragmentation to the populations, like to the <clears throat> statistics? <clears throat> yep, sorry. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, I think this is mentioned in the 2018 paper when I looked at the disk properties. Um, so most of the binaries actually come from just uh, core fragmentation or turbulent fragmentation rather than disk fragmentation. I think uh, from memory, it's something like a seventh, maybe 15, 20 percent of systems involve disk fragmentation. Um, so it definitely happens and it definitely produces or it's involved in producing um, uh, close binary systems and intermediate binary systems. Um, but it's not the dominant mechanism. And that's why I said the question before, I, I talked about this um, increase in binary frequency at, uh, sorry, close binary frequency at low metallicities. You'll notice that I said um, fragmentation of gas is, depends on the metallicity. And I didn't specify whether I meant disk fragmentation or cloud fragmentation. It's because both is affected by the low metallicity of the gas. All right. And so a lot of these close binaries actually come from um, orbital decay of uh, just turbulent fragmentation or core fragmentation rather than from disk fragmentation. All right, uh, Andrew. Yeah, hi, Matthew. Thanks for the talk. So no, no arguments with Newton's third law. Uh, I'm just curious, you, you noted the difficulties of the co-orbital material inside the Roche lobe close to the planet and compared that to the stellar binary case. I'm wondering if, it, if it's clear that it's the same issue. Uh, so is it the is it the material that's inside the Roche lobes of the stellar binaries that's causing the the torques to cause that uh, lead to outward migration? So I looked at um, ah dear. Oh, so, so it was a very long weekend. So I looked at um, there's a paper in 2017. Um, I can't remember now. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, Tangatel, I think. Um, so they, I mean, for example, they specifically show that the uh, outward torques um, are basically coming from material um, close to the binary itself, right? And there's another one as well, but I forget which. Maybe Tideratel. Well, <laughs> well, some of them. Yeah, but some of them show it quite clearly in the paper, whereas other ones it's quite opaque what's going on. So, um, but um, 
but yeah, so these are definitely showing that the, the outwards, these supposed outward talks, uh, which are dominating the evolution of the binary are all happening very, very close to the components themselves. And I don't know, all, all I'll say, is this exactly the same problem as what I was talking about in the planet case? I don't know, because I haven't looked at it, but I worry about it, okay? And I know that we had a lot of discussion about this 20 years ago for the planet case. Um, and um, my solution was then to stop doing calculations where you didn't conserve momentum. Um, and maybe that's gonna help resolve this as well here. All right, thanks. Um, Paul, Elena, who wants to go ahead? Okay, uh, I'll be pretty quick, I think. Um, so, um, first of all, let me say you're very brave uh, for, <laughs> uh, I think you uh, called out uh, a lot of numericists in the room with that uh, statement about Newton's third law. Um, and rather than argue with you about it, I, I'll just say this is an excellent advertisement for our code comparison that we're doing as part of this program. Uh, and as I know, you, you know, of course, you're already doing this, uh, but, uh, but it's, a, you know, Everybody has their little details that they think might be important. Uh, let's find out. You know, we're all, let's make sure we're all doing exactly the same problem, and then you can bring your code, and then you can, you know, test what happens when you turn Newton's law on, Newton's <laughs> law on and off. We have codes. This is the great thing about having a hydro code is you can do these things. You can actually experiment with these things and see whether that actually matters. So, uh, and I hope. Uh, other people uh, in the room are also interested in, uh, in joining us, uh, but, but uh, it's going to be really important to try to do exactly, you know, we agree on the same solution to exactly the same problem. And then once we do, you're free to you see what happens when you tweak things. Yeah, I completely agree. And over the weekend, I managed to reproduce your talk from the first orbit as well. So we now have agreement of that. So. Excellent, excellent. Yes, we can turn on and off Newton's third law. That sounds like a great experiment. All right, uh, do you have one more question, Elena? Uh, yeah. Hi, Matthew, it's Elena Rossi here. Uh, stepping out from uh, migration, so no migration, accretion. Um, I was wondering if you could summarize uh, briefly what you think is the more important thing that we learn uh, uh, about uh, the formation and evolution of mini disks around black holes from uh, observation and simulation of binary stars, given the differences, uh, what would be the most important takeaway? Um, <clears throat> well, I've never looked at the binary black hole problem myself, um, <clears throat> but but um, I imagine you know that that's going to be a lot harder to simulate in detail, primarily because of the. Uh, the very thin disks, presumably, that are uh, around a lot of these systems. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be my main concern. Um, I use SPH a lot, and it's very easy to get high viscosity in SPH. So if these disks in black hole systems have effective high viscosities due to, say, um, fully ionized disks of MRI, um, then that doesn't worry me so much. But the, but the, the disk thickness um, is, is hard to model. So. All right, and I think one last question. Uh, sure, yeah, thanks. So it's really amazing work. Sorry, uh, can you Mar say your name? Yeah, uh, Mark Avera. Um, we've talked of Newton, but I think Maxwell maybe would uh, feel left out. Um, for the for the cluster simulation, while I saw that, it made me immediately think of like Eve Ostriker simulations with magnetic fields and that sort of thing. I would imagine the topology in each star forming region might be different of the large scale field. So can we start to say here statistically that the large scale field maybe isn't important in individual systems or, or does more specific work need to be done in that regard? So for MHD in particular, so um, James Verster, who's currently at St. Andrews in the UK <clears throat> and I have worked um, for many years, he's uh, modeling non-ideal MHD with SPH for these sorts of Star formation simulations. Um, and we have a paper which is published, when was that, 2019 or 2020, somewhere around there, <clears throat> with the first non ideal MHD star cluster formation simulations. And <clears throat> they're, they're, they're smaller than the one that I showed because these just take a lot longer to run. Um, but you get the same sort of processes going on. We don't have very good statistics in terms of disk properties and binary properties and so on. 
but you form the disks. Um, the non-ideal MHT helps in disk formation, but also just the fact that you've got a very chaotic environment, right? You, you're not creating a single star from a, a rotating cloud with a uniform magnetic field. It's probably the worst possible case for forming disks uh, due to angular momentum um, transfer through the magnetic field, magnetic breaking. Um, <clears throat> when you go to these much more chaotic systems, um, you seem to naturally form disks in a very similar way, I would say, to the pure hydro results. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, let's uh, give Matthew another big round of applause.